Don't ever let anybody make you be ashamed of who you are, whether it be of what you have, or what color you have, or what religion you have, or anything. Shinjong coronavirus 때문에 오랜만에 비행기를 탔습니다. 제가 살고 있는 오하우에서 비행기로 40분 정도 걸리는 하와이 섬은 빅 아일랜드라는 별명에 걸맞게 하와이 주요 섬중 면적이 가장 넓고 또 그만큼 다양한 자연의 얼굴을 만날 수 있는 곳입니다. 지금 이 순간에도 붉은 용암이 들끓고 있는 세계 최대의 활화산이 있는가 하면 생명력이 넘치는 숲과 계단식 폭포 그리고 커피로 유명한 코나도 바로 이 하와이 섬에 있습니다. 코나가 세계적인 휴양지인데 반해 섬 반대편에 있는 힐로는 주민들이 일상을 일구어 가는 곳입니다. 이국적인 하와이 섬의 풍광들을 보고 있자면 과연 이곳이 우리나라와 어떤 관련이 있을까 싶어지는데요. 1903년 하와이 섬에서 사탕수수 산업이 성행하던 시기 보다 나은 삶을 찾아 대한제국을 떠나 이 섬을 찾아온 한국인들이 있습니다. 지금 만나러 가는 해리 김전 하와이 카운티 시장의 부모도 바로 그 한인 이민 역사의 시작점에 있었습니다. 한 3년 전쯤이었던 것 같은데요. 오하우에서 한 행사장에 오신 시장님을 뵌 적이 있습니다. 그때 시장님이 연설 끝나고 나오셨을 때 제가 한 가지 질문을 드렸어요. 그게 뭐였냐면 음, 한국에서 아주 소중한 친구가 하와이에 온다면 하와이 어디를 보여주고 싶은지 여쭤봤는데요. 그때 시장님이 해주신 이야기가 아주 인상적이었습니다. Thank you for bringing it up, but if I had that one day with anyone in Korea, truthfully, outside of that, I really want to, them to see the Koreans' contribution to life, not just for Hawaii Island, really a contribution in regards to making this a better world because of what you people have done. Uh, I could talk to you for a day and a day and a half and a month. You people are special and you don't even know it. Oh, and I will spend that day showing them that. Oh, great. Thank okay. you, sir. 네, 그래서 그때 몇 날, 며칠이고 해줄 수 있다고 하신 이야기를 언젠가 기회가 되면 꼭 들어보고 싶다고 생각했는데요. 오늘이 바로 그날입니다. 가난한 이민자 스라 팔남매의 막내로 태어난 해리 김전 하와이 카운티 시장은 비가일랜드 민방위국 수장으로 20여 년에 걸쳐 쌓은 주민들의 신뢰를 바탕으로 지난 2000년 미국 역사상 한국인 최초로 시장직에 올랐습니다. 2020년 12월 그가 삼선 시장으로서의 마지막 임기를 수행하던 날 데이빗 이계 주지사는 지난 36년 공직을 수행한 해리 김전 시장을 청렴한 공무원의 표본으로 칭하면서 훈장과 감사장을 수여했습니다. I am Harry Kim. My parents, both of them, were born and raised in Korea. And unfortunately, uh, the reason they came to Hawaii is because of hard times in Korea, whether it be of uh, hardship of economy or war. I have, you know, two sons, uh, one wife from Oregon. I think the most important thing in my life is to have people know that I work to have their trust. The most important thing of uh, possession of anything is things that are for family and to make things good for them. The most end result of when I leave this earth is if I know that I raised or had a part in them being happy people. 
it's my honor to meet you, especially in a pandemic, to be able to talk with you in person really is special. You know, since you bring up pandemic, uh, it's 11 o'clock in the morning. I've been on the phone several times since five this morning. All of it about the pandemic from various people. The time for working around it and worrying about this or being nice is, I think, way past. We better think about survival and minimize the impact, especially to our children. Anyway, right. back right, to the right. subject. No, right, right. Thank you for um, all your hard work. You know, ah, thank are, you, thank you. I realize that your email address has how only Manu, which means happy bird in Hawaiian. Why did you um, have that in your email? I was born in a place uh, and my nearest neighbor for the most part, three sides were over three miles away. Mm -hmm. So the forest is my friend and all the creatures of the forest. And the forest of its beauty, you know, of its giving, and that became who I was. If you look at this house, it's, uh, I tell people it's a plain house, but I didn't want to cut these trees, but I made the house, uh, the trees part of my house, where I don't feel I'm wasted. You know, what's distracted me is the call of the, the doves out there. Uh, they're very abundant. I have cardinals that came in. I just not too recently befriended two Hawaiian ducks, the hybrids, and for no reason they came. I came out one morning, the sun was barely shining, and up rather, and the two ducks was there. You know, I named them, my granddaughter named them. Believe it or not, they, they know their names shortly. You know. uh, really, you really communicate with those, um, all the creatures around your house? Oh, yeah. I don't know anything more important. I guess you um, growing up surrounded by nature impacted you, um, oh, yeah. having all this love for the nature, I guess, right? Yeah, and not to belabor of poverty, but going back to my parents, uh, if we grew up, I think, striving for materialism, I think we would be very unhappy people because we had nothing, right? First generation of your um, family are your parents. They came from Korea. Do you know when? You know, there's very little I know about my parents. When people interview me and the subject comes to, well, what is your greatest regret? Or what would you do differently? Always it's the same answer. As a boy growing up, I wish I was better. I wish I was smarter. I wish I was a better thinker. I wish I was smart enough or adult enough to tell them, boy, you're something special, Dad. Yeah. And not even that. Not even, not one time can I remember, not one time, saying thank you. How can I be, right? But I never thought my father worked seven days a week, come back from working at the plantation in very hard ways, walking to and from work and they would work in the garden. My mom working the same seven days a week. I wish I had, I could, the only thing I would turn the clock back is I would talk to them. How old were you when your father passed away? 15, 15, oh, 15 16, young. yeah. And, and your mom were able to uh, meet My your mom was able to meet my grandson, I mean my son. All I know it was, you know, just prior to the annexation. All I know is that somehow, Lord knows how, he went to Busan. And all I know is he came to Hawaii to work in a plantation. 100% except for small things like fishermen or this and that, of this island was sugar. That was the whole economy. And then, so. and then your mom, My mom met stayed him home. here. She, she met yeah, him here. Yeah, sure. She came as a picture bride. Yeah. Oh, I wish I could tell my mom, how did you do it, mom? How did you give birth to the eight children? 
in a home with one bedroom, wooden stove at first, you know, kerosene after that. I cannot imagine the, the pain they must have suffered, the, the sadness, the responsibility. Uh, you know, when you learn about my oldest sister, which I never met, I'm told that she carried my sister to the plantation hospital about six miles away, got her back. and told that your daughter's dead, carried her right back home. I cannot imagine the agony of that, the strength it takes to carry on, the strength it takes to carry on without self-pity. And not one time when I would hear her and Mrs. Chung and Mrs. Park, her best friends, good friends, talk, Never of pity, never. That's where I'm so lucky to be raised by strength. What, what, kind, what kind of mom was she? Was she more gentle than your dad, or was she like, did she nag a lot? <laughs> or My mother she... was the general. She wore the pants. <laughs> yeah, and everything else. My father was the guy that quietly did things and worked, you know, not making life hard for her by grumbling about this or that. But she was like most, and men don't like to admit it, but uh, my mama definitely was the strength of the family, you know, in making us work to, for tomorrow. So uh, it was, uh, as sisters, I can see my mom in them. You know of what they did in their life. Being a mayor for like 12 years, I wanted to ask you this as well. There must be time that you feel really stressed and you can't just complain to anybody, right? Oh, I <laughs> but do. What do you, you do something, but how do you um, cope with your stress? Like when you want to feel um, happier, what do you, what do you do? The hardest job I had was not mayor. The hardest job I had in regards to people, decision making, was 24 years of civil defense. Well, many remember Harry Kim's deep voice on the radio that would inform people of natural disasters. It was perhaps during this time that he became a local legend. As lava approached homes, Kim was on the front lines. All residents and uh, local on the street, Malta, uh, Highway 130, please leave the area due to smoke and fire hazard and the lava flow approaching this area. With that iconic voice of calm, even in the face of disaster. And when you have the responsibility of people who depend on government to be there when you need them, that's a hell of a burden. We can never undo damage. That's not our job. Although we did follow up and we're still following up. When you know with all you feel that you did your best, with the best information you have, and even if you could Monday night quarterback, turn it back, there's very little you would have changed, except not make it happen, which you cannot change. There will always be criticism. But as long as you know of truth, this is the best you could do. And when you make the decision, I told people that when training, if you know within yourself, even if you could turn the clock back, you could not have done it different. There is no stress. Believe it or not, there is none. When you're looking back um, past maybe 10, 20 years, when were you proud of yourself the most? The worst eruption we, I went through was a place called Kalapana Kaimu, Black Sand Beach. It was a very slow moving flow. And then there was a time where I had to call the whole community together and say, you are under threat. 
gave them a system of if you're in condition one, that means you must prepare to leave within 24 hours. And, and when he came to Kaimu or Black Sand Beach, it was going to be totally buried. You know, I talked to leaders that this whole area is going to be evacuated, that beautiful Black Sand Beach. Percy came up to me and said, you know, Harry, I need to ask you a favor. I allowed visitors to come in a controlled area. Can you ask everybody to leave so we can have one time alone with our home? It's not just a home. Uh, people who don't understand uh, loss of uh, property, especially from Oahu or their neighbor island, uh, the land is something that will never be the same in their lifetime. It takes 200 years to make it look like this. They would talk to me before that of who built that road or who planted that coconut tree or where the tutu or tutu lip came in or was buried, all family graves, all that kind of things, you know. Born and raised generation after generation. I asked the police to help me, and they thought, Harry, you had two, three thousand people. They're not going to leave. You know? but, uh, I went on my speaker. For those of you who are visiting, I ask of you to leave the people of heritage of their home alone to say goodbye. They need to be alone. I'm asking you by certain time to leave. To this day, I felt so joyful about people doing that. They just left. Yeah. And these were strangers, and a lot of sightseers from all over, you know, they left. What was the um, hardest decision that you had to make? Oh, there's a lot of things every day. It was this Hawaiian man that, you know, came over and said, Harry, uh, uh, the place was all evacuated. Can I go back to my property and say aloha one more time? So of course, and I walked him and there was a stone wall. I said, I'm going to be right here. And, you know, when I think it's time for you to go because of the fumes of the lava, you know, you need to go. And you have no doubt they would listen. And he said, okay. And I stayed back and let him be alone. And then his wife came, then a kid came. And I just stayed out of their way. And I felt the greatest of sadness, I wish you could do more. What made me feel good? I've got the picture somewhere. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture of Kaimu. One of the last pictures taken before it was covered. Came to the door a couple of months after. I looked at the picture, it was nice, you know. Yeah, and she said, look at the back. And like that, it was all handwritten words by various people of saying thank you. And I thought, boy, they lost everything they had in life. And never you know, will they ever be able to find a replacement of that kind. And they're telling me, a person of government, thank you. Awesome. And I always use that within myself of why I, we work. After a while, I had a trailer there, a small trailer. 
someone was coming to the trailer almost every day to put flowers inside for me. Yeah. And once in a while, a plate of cookies or something. And I used to just shake my head. Uh, could I do that if my place was being destroyed and worry about the damn government worker? But that's how you, know, you, you felt a bond with each other. What was the reason that you decided to leave that um, and run for the mayor? I didn't decide to run for the mayor, tell you truthfully. Oh, yeah, um, I planned my retirement because I was offered a job some time ago that when I leave, would you consider working for UNESCO, you know, UN, and uh, for different countries? Boy, the opportunity to go help another country, yeah. And I said yes, and so I backed off my retirement to that day. So I think June 30th was my last day of work, and August I left Honduras. And felt very good about going uh, to a new challenge. And uh, in that time, people started to look to be a run for mayor. I said, mm-mm. Uh, and something very beautiful happened. I remember my son coming home one day, here. I said, Harry, Dad, there's a big group of people sign waving for you. You know, who are they? I said, I don't know. He said, sure, you better go down. And next thing I know, there were ads in the paper, the news radio station. There was this woman I got to tell you about, and don't ask me her name. Somebody said, hey, that's a beautiful song they, read, uh, they sang about, you know, you and being mayor. There was some ads in a paper that was funny, but obviously everybody paid it. I had nothing to do with it, nothing. What was your goal as a mayor? What I tell you, have people trust the government. I promise you know, them this, I will never make a decision based on politics. In your um, campaign, you were um, committed that you will receive only a certain amount, $10, Ten no more was, than $10 donation. Um, and do you remember this? This is a rejection letter. <laughs> <laughs> written by you. Obviously, it was sent to my friend in Honolulu who sent you more than $10 to support you, and you rejected and then you um, refunded the money with this letter. Do you remember this? Of course. I was, $10? Yeah, like, yeah. like why, why did you do that? <laughs> I have a best friend. He's Hawaiian, grew up together. To this day, he's still my best friend. I told him, hey, Solo, I'm gonna run for mayor. And he said, hey, when you sell a ticket, don't make it too expensive. You know I don't have money. <laughs> <laughs> and we laughed, you know. He didn't really mean it, but you know, I thought about it. And that's one of the reasons why people distrust right? money. So I sat down and I did the following. There will be no campaign organization. So I don't care who you are, if you want to help, fine, you do it my way, or oh, thank you. Naturally, everybody thought, is Harry crazy or just stupid? Do you think he has a chance? Well, obviously, I didn't think I had a chance. But that's okay. Okay, so then you won with 50% votes, which is nearly twice um, as much as your um, next rival, your, your um, closest rival. Um, and you became the first Korean descendant um, who became a mayor in the United States. I knew how proud my mom would be. Did you know what it says of truth? of nationality, we are Americans and proud Americans. Because of ethnicity and of art, 
We are from our home country. And my home country is Korea. And then I realized you have a responsibility, Harry, also to the Koreans in Korea. You represent them. Likewise, if you become something they're ashamed of, you know, they would be ashamed too. Going back to your childhood, what's your fondest memory? A little boy named Harry Kim running to the store and says, Mr. Akiyama or Mr. Suzuki, you know, to the store. Hey, oh, Kim boy. And they give us a daily loaf of bread and I'd carry it home. Never asked us for money. We, everybody charged towards his return. And you pay when you can, amount you could. Not me, the parents, obviously. I told Eddie, the son of Mr. Suzuki, at his, when they told me to, of the service, how much joy his father gave me by his smile, of his goodness to me. Kindness. Just, yeah, mm -hmm. pure kindness. Pure kindness. No one judgmental of any kind. Right. One of um, the most respected poets in Korea, whose name is Kim Yong Tak, um, he once told me that there's a, like a certain certain beauty that can be only nurtured from growing up, you know, not worthy, poor. That's not replaceable. Whoever said it, it takes a village, must have been poor, right? When that poet you talk about, I never thought about it. You had to be, but it's an absolute, you have to be. Because when you raise like that, it is of those things of your question that you would never feel if you were not of hardship. I just told this to my wife yesterday when we were going up the hill the, uh, where we used to live in Hilo when we first moved. I was 19. And there was this man that was sitting on his porch. He goes, I, you know, I didn't know who he was. I found out later his name is Mr. Yagi, head of the tax office. Always waved to me. I'm 19, just that wave, and I, f I just felt so good. Yeah. I've told many people that when I graduated from school, high school, there's no parties. I walked home from the main road and slaughterhouse at that time, as you call it, I was working and one man said, hey, Kim, Kimbo, what you doing at so late in the night, you know? I said, oh, I just graduated tonight, so I'm going home. And he said, congratulations. I've told many people this. To this day, it's all like the only one person that said to me, congratulations. Today, nobody would believe a story like that. Those are the things only when years pass when you answer a question like yours of what made you feel good, what the happy and things like that. Small things like the best slingshot stick. If I, oh, like from this. Picking the sweetest guava, who could climb the coconut tree the fastest. Everything, you know, of those things. You appreciate it. He felt good about it. And maybe that's what's wrong today. Huh? If you make materialism and money your goal in life, I think you will find a very, very empty and lonesome road at the end of the road. And I know within me that it's of truth. But we spend time just to make things better for others, not for you, but for others, and yours as well. It's going to be a very comforting end at the end of the road, yeah, because you'll be surrounded with good feelings. Going through articles on you before I met you, there are people um, commented you know, about you um, online, and there was a one saying that I really liked. You want to hear what that was? Um, someone says that um, Harry Kim is 
an embodiment of the Aloha spirit. How beautiful is that? <laughs> How beautiful is that? That's the, that's the biggest compliment you can get, don't you think? Oh, yeah. It's like, in part, when they gave me that picture with all those writings, I'm telling you, you know, it's the kind of things that a billion dollars times a hundred can never even touch. The biggest dream I have is, I think, what my parents had, and I just carried it on, that there will be one Korea. I think of that all the time. And I wish, I pray that that day will come. <laughs>